Hello and welcome to Mindscapes, our series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, philosophies and visions shape contemporary India. My guest tonight is one of India's leading preeminent legal minds. I'm delighted to welcome Mr. Fali Nariman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Nariman, why is it that uh, most uh, successful lawyers either join the bench or politics? Well, since I don't belong to either category, why have you resisted either both? category? <laughs> I can say that uh, once a lawyer, I think uh, you must stick to your last. That's my own view, and uh, you must remember that a successful lawyer has an ego, and uh, that ego, I think, tends to get deflated when it takes to politics, <laughs> and perhaps that's one of the reasons why one doesn't take to politics. Although it would be an extraordinarily good thing if. It could be combined like they used to do in the old days. And what about the bench? Ah, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> what is the story? <laughs> well, I suppose there are, there, are, there are two aspects of the bench. Uh, when you get successful at an early age and you are not picked up at that particular point of time, and there are reasons, good reasons, I think, why judges who are very young are not appointed and correctly then uh, it becomes more difficult to persuade them later. Of course, I, I must say in fairness that I was asked uh, long, long ago when I was only 38 and so on and uh, to come on the bench. But at that particular point of time, I had to support a mother and a grandmother and so on. And uh, the salaries were not what they are today. Perhaps it was just financial. But it's a very attractive thing to have people who are successful lawyers being judges and I think they would make good judges and in fact I've proposed to the Chief Justices repeatedly that we should have ad hoc judges from the bar and I'm sure people would for a year or two or three years be judges as they are in other parts of the world. Have you found that as a lawyer that you've had to take on uh, cases that you did not believe in because sort of the law demands that both sides of a, a point of view need to be represented? Yeah, that's the classic uh, justification for the lawyer. But uh, this is more perhaps on the criminal side. On the civil side, you can pick and choose, particularly at a certain stage. But of course, it's true that you should not risk a client's reputation by declining a particular brief when you are normally accepting briefs in that particular court. Because then the word gets around that uh, so-and-so is not appearing from a X or Y only because uh, he thinks that uh, he's dishonest or not uh, proper and things like that. But that's not quite fair, I think. Have you had to sort of take on cases that you didn't believe in? Uh, yes, I suppose you don't have to necessarily, as a lawyer, you don't have to necessarily believe in a civil c case. You don't have to necessarily believe in a cause. The lawyer doesn't think very much about whether this client has a good case or has he not, not a good case. But what is it that I can put forward which may be acceptable in law without in any way, I mean, garbling the facts because the facts are already there. Is it always just a, a, a good case or a bad case? Uh, isn't there sometimes the feeling that this is right and, and this is wrong? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. There are, there, are, there are cases of that sort. There are cases where you feel that this is right, this is wrong. And uh, I mean, it, it happens. Uh, what happened? For instance, you, know, you, you, you were, you were in, in, in the Union Carbide case. Ah, that's right. That's right. Um, You're absolutely right. Now, there, for instance, perhaps over the years, uh, if you'd asked me today, I may not have accepted it. About 12 years ago, well, I thought it was a good challenge more than anything else. Perhaps I didn't see the, what required to be seen, I think that uh, it was a case which rendered a lot of people homeless, a lot of people dead. And that was a very serious problem. And uh, the only assurance I took from my clients at the time when I took the case was that they wouldn't pay less than what they had offered in the American courts, which of course was not substantial. It was 200 million or something like that. Ultimately, we ended up by paying 420 million. US dollars. But it was a case where I think the law was deficient, totally deficient. And uh, unfortunately, we haven't learned from that case. 
that, that's, that's a very uh, alarming situation. What is there that we, we ought to have learned from the case? I'll didn't. tell you. The important thing in a case of that sort is to have a law, which they do have now in many parts of the world, where an interim amount of damages can be fixed ad hoc to be finally determined by a forum, whatever forum it is. Now, in our three-tier system, this would take uh, forever. doomsday forever. So that was the deficiency in the law. The law didn't provide for an interim relief of damages until liability was established. And this perhaps prolonged the agony of the compensation amount being fixed and paid. Ultimately, it was a matter which was got settled in the Supreme Court. And of course, the criminal part of it is still open. It's going on. I'm not handling that part of it. You have uh, been a fortune on, 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 on both sides in a sense of justice uh, for um, in, in, in the Indian Express case during the emergency. You were opposing the emergency while still uh, a young lawyer. Uh, you were also sort of uh, the lawyer for the, for the government uh, on, on the Narmada case. When you went into a, a case like the Narmada case, and you were talking about here about people who are, who are displaced and who are affected and, and, and impacted by this. Uh, and, and, and simultaneously, you were, in, you were impacted by the idea of the minorities being uh, neglected, or shall we say, uh, uh, harmed in some ways by government policies. How do these two coexist? I'll tell you. Sensitivity, acute sensitivity you. on the one hand. I'll tell you, you're quite right. Yeah, that's a point which is well taken. Uh, well, the main problem in the Narbada dispute at the moment uh, is about the effectiveness of rehabilitation. That's the main problem, how effective it is. But I don't share the belief that big dams or medium-sized dams are an evil and therefore they shouldn't be had at all. I would go along with the theory, and this is what exactly what the court is doing at the moment. And that's why they restrain the height, etc., for long periods of time. To be satisfied that, and this is a sort of a humanitarian justice, not uh, the, the actually the, the, the uh, law-wise, as it were. Mm -hmm. There would be no jurisdiction for the courts to say anything at all, mm -hmm. because there's also, there's al this is already the subject matter of an award, which is right. ancient now, for 20 years old, and the Constitution expressly says that you have no, no business, the courts have no business to look into it. Right. But yet the courts are doing it. And they are doing it in exercise of their jurisdiction under Article 21, which is the life and liberty clause of our Constitution. And I think that, that, is, that is a correct approach. Now, therefore, if the rehabilitation work, which, is, which was deficient in the past, which is being undertaken, is found not to be proper, then certainly there should be no raising of the height of the dam. But if people are dishoused for a wider public purpose, because you must remember that the dam is not because someone has some grandiose ideas to build a dam, but because it, it, it benefits a very much larger number of people ultimately than those who are displaced. Now, these are the two conundrums. Right. And the, the, the smaller public interest at the moment, right. the larger public interest of the future. You may take one view, and I respect people who take one view, but uh, you have to take the other view as well. Therefore, I don't accept this theory that uh, you, must, you must cut off everything at a particular point of time. Do you get involved in, in, in choices such as these as, as a citizen of India, not just a lawyer? Yeah, I suppose I should. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but I don't. Yeah, there, one should, but uh, you see, one is, these are matters which do get into the law. Today, there is almost nothing that doesn't get ultimately into the law courts. People are so, I won't say frustrated, but they are so conscious of their rights, and very correctly too, that I don't share the view that the courts are breaking down or the system is breaking down. On the contrary, I think the more people go into courts, doesn't matter if they get cluttered up, it's our job to see that they don't get cluttered up. But the more people go, go into courts, the better it is for the system of the administration of justice, because administration of justice doesn't mean fighting it out on the streets, but trying to get the best form of an adjudication as you can humanly today provide.
through the courts. But, but isn't it likely that the more people uh, you know, approach the courts and, and, and don't get justice because it takes a very long time, uh, that different forms of justice will spill onto the streets as is happening in Bombay? Well, actually, or, yes, you are right. Now, there general. again, uh, there are different other forms of justice which don't necessarily require people to take up cudgels and uh, fight in the streets, such as alternate dispute resolution. It could be made compulsory. We have a large number of programs like that. Lok Adalats, which the present Chief Justice of India has, uh, I mean, he's very, very keen to have more and more of these. But in an enormous continent like ours, with a population seething with, not only with numbers, but seething also with discontent and in very large sections are very poor, uh, there has to be perhaps a different approach to the administration of justice. Some judges like Krishna, Bhagwati, etc., they provided that approach and that's been working, like the public interest litigation, which uh, we have found quite effective, except that you have the odd person who, in the na name of public interest litigation, goes in for a private interest litigation, <laughs> for somebody else's private interest, not his own. Uh, would you say that we are becoming, or some societies become inherently litigious societies like the United States and, and, and what are the forces of factors uh, that, that create societies which are more litigious than others and, and, and are we headed in that direction? More than societies, I think it's individuals. I remember reading in some biography of a Lord Chancellor in England that when he was a counsel, he went to the House of Lords to argue a particular case and apparently the law lords were very short with him and the client knew he was losing. And when they came out, he pulled his gown and said, Sir, can't we go higher? <laughs> so he turned around and said, My dear fellow, they should breed from you. <laughs> you see, there are people who are more litigious than others. Uh -huh. There are some who prefer, who are in business or com commercial minded, who would like to have a resolution, a quick resolution of the dispute. But there is a tendency amongst us particularly and amongst a large number of people. If you go to Australia, for instance, you found, find that one of the states, New South Wales, is the most liti litigious in Australia. Similarly, you find in many parts of our country. And I, I think the rural areas are even more litigious in their own rights and they're very conscious of their rights. They want it adjudicated and they are not satisfied until a court determines it. That's the confidence out of confidence they have in the courts. But I think that the more the free press today in our country takes up causes, which, is, which they do, and I'm very happy to see that. They contribute, I think the media, the free press, they contribute remarkably, I think, to a proper understanding of the, the various difficulties that arise in litigation, how they are to be resolved, how they can be better resolved, and how can it can be brought into the limelight. And it is because of reporters who report things that judges, for instance, pick up a particular nasty case and say, give notice suo moto as it's called. The court takes it up on itself. I mean, this is all because the, the journalists today and the media today are far more uh, uh, courageous, I think, and uh, very involved in whatever they do. do and I, I, have, I have great respect and regard uh, for the, uh, the media. Do you think that... Even the, when they go for people. <laughs> <laughs> do you think the press goes uh, enough for, for judges and, and, and the judiciary? And they the, are a little and afraid of the Contempt Act. Yes, <laughs> that, that's the problem. You see, this is the, the judiciary enshrouds itself in this law of contempt, which is a very difficult sort of law uh, to understand. Uh, it's a, in other jurisdictions, it's known as dog law. Uh -huh. see, Jeremy Bentham used to say that when, I, when, I, when uh, I want something to be done by my dog, I first beat him <laughs> and then he understands what's not to be done. Uh -huh. Contempt law is a little like that. Uh -huh. It's a very vague sort of law which uh, you have to be very careful of. But at the same time, you must remember that in countries like ours, particularly in the developing world, there is such a thing as the majesty of the law, the awesomeness of the law the fear of the law. The judge is God. The judge is, is virtually God. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. In fact, Lord Goff gave a lecture here some years ago, and the Patak Law lecture, and he said that the difference be between Germany and England is mm -hmm. that in Germany the professor is God, mm -hmm. in England the judge is God, mm -hmm. and India too, the judge is God. And it should be. I think it's, it's good. It's good. At a certain stage, 
And it's also good that they go at 65. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be judges for life. I'm totally opposed to judges being, the people being judges for life. Yet there has been, uh, you know, the credibility of, of the highest court has been frequently uh, questioned, um, you know, during the emergency uh, in particular. And, and, and that, that was sort of a more focused... Uh, um, it has never lived that down. Yes. The emergency episode was the worst. And I was a witness to it, so I know all about it. But it was the worst. Yes, absolutely. What are correct. the? What are the? What are the? But it's very difficult to say what what uh, what you require. You see, uh, I suppose it's a human failing. I, I don't see why there should be the fear of anything in a judge at all, especially in the judge of the highest court. No one can do anything to you. Literally, no one, and no one will, quite frankly. And yet there is that absurd uh, sort of idea that uh, something might happen. But fortunately now. I think the emergency was a good inoculation for our judges, but is it or for the country as well. It's very good. It Two years were very good, I think, in, <laughs> in retrospect. Uh -huh. I know, don't support the emergency at all. In fact, I, I was yes. opposed to it. But, uh, but it was, in retrospect, a good inoculation. So that we are now steeled with all this. We know how the tricks are played, what happens and so on. And uh, therefore, the, You'll find the, the, the earnestness with which liberty is now defended in the courts, particularly by the judges themselves, is, is quite remarkable. Isn't the motivation frequently not fear but greed? Of uh, where? Of in, in, in the judiciary, whether it's political patronage to follow uh, tenure as, as chief justice or it's just plain payoff in, 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 in the law. I don't think Russian now. I don't think it, it perhaps happened before, but I, I don't think now. I think everyone is, you see, there are, there are watchdogs all around. So when you, when you have people, when you are high, the higher you go, the light becomes brighter. More people watch you. So it's very difficult for any particular person in that position to, because a judge has to maintain a certain uh, high dignity of office which the constitution gives to him because he has powers of life and death. He has enormous powers, especially the, the judge in India. And, uh, it's good to have people to watch as well. They're good to have people to criticize. And I'm sure that uh, they, they respond to criticism. But you must know what to say and how to say it. This sort of, you know, the perennial, uh, shall we say, you know, balancing act between the executive and, and, and the judiciary, uh, this too has been a struggle in, in some senses uh, in India. Do you feel that ultimately the, uh, the, it is the executive and parliament that is supreme and we have a number of delicate cases uh, and issues uh, coming up that uh, involve amending uh, the constitution, changing the law. Um, when does it become appropriate uh, for parliament or, or, or the people's will in, as reflected in parliament to, to concretely intervene? Now let me put it this way. I am not very satisfied and the voting pattern doesn't show that we should be satisfied that the people will a particular thing. Number of people who vote in the first instance is woefully inadequate and at any particular election. And therefore, to speak of the people's will is a good theory. That's how our constitution starts off, we the people. I mean, that's the theoretical basis of the constitution. But there it ends. There has to be some organ or organization which ultimately does not depend upon the people's votes and who is in a position to interpret that document. And I think that in under all circumstances, it can only be a responsible judiciary. How much goes into a particular judgment, how much, how little goes into it, whether the judge has motives, he doesn't have motives, etc. Different questions, individual questions. But in the, in the, in the, the I don't think we have yet conceived of a pattern of government where the judiciary does not have a say in most things that matter. It's all over the world you find it. This judicial activism that people are speaking of in this country, it's not only here. You, you look at the United Kingdom, you look at all the courts in the, around the world and you find that more and more are judges taking up various causes which they would not do so many years ago only because the pressures on the politician not to take up that cause are far greater today. Therefore, an, an individual who doesn't depend upon the vote is more likely to do 
justice or take up cudgels for a particular section which needs to be protected. Take minorities for instance. Minorities in my opinion do need to be protected. Our framers of the constitution said they should be protected. But then the protection that you will ultimately get is the protection that's meted out by the highest court. There's no other way in which that can be done. But we have uh, you know, uh, frequently seen that, um, you know, that, 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 that the court tends to, as happened in the Ayodhya case, seem to hedge a position. Yes, that does happen. And uh, perhaps we learn from the experience because it, it was, you see, these earth-shaking cases sometimes do produce bad law. It was the emergency case which uh, produced very bad law. The ADM Jabalpur mm -hmm. case is a, is a decision which have never will live down. But I, ne I always remind the judges of, <laughs> of it so that they never forget. Mm -hmm. And so that we don't repeat it mm -hmm. for, at any rate. But uh, that's, uh, that's uh, a problem where I think uh, it depends on our own, uh, our own uh, ways of looking at things, our own ethos. You know, you are also, as we discovered at a lecture at the Indian International Center the other day, uh, a man of faith as much as you are a man of uh, letters and, 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 and the law. And the older I grow, the more faith I have, actually, because I, I be sincerely believe that if you lose your communication with the Almighty, there's very little that uh, people around you can do to help you. I mean, I, I'm one of those. I'm a believer, as uh -huh, it were. Yeah. Uh -huh. So what, what constitutes uh, your belief? In, 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 in what ways does it mold and guide and, and govern your everyday life? Well, I think religion does uh, guide a particular person and particularly, I mean, I'm not propagating my religion, but a religion of good morals, which is basically our religion, does uh, help to, uh, to guide you and perhaps warn you more than guide you in your daily lives that, well, you have to do certain things, you don't have to do certain things. You see, we, we are people who are supposed to abominate the lie. We are supposed to respect the truth. We can't do it always, I assure you. Not that we don't, nor do we do it always. But it's a good thing to have as a precept. And I think if you don't have a precept of life or some foundation, some philosophy, you call it God, call it uh, Jesus Christ, call it anything you like. But if you don't have some anchorage in life, uh, then I be, uh, then I believe that uh, then you 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 tend to go berserk and uh, there is no guidepost there is nothing to fear and I believe that fear is a very good thing for a human being he must have the fear of God or fear of the other world on him so as to guide him in this world. If you were you know what law minister or, or, or chief justice of India uh, you know both possibilities which you have denied yourselves and in, yourself in some ways. What are the, some of the things that you would do? Well, in the first place, I think that the more judges push cases along, there are, the problem with us is we, have, we are surfeit of cases, of all sorts, criminal cases, civil cases. The more civil cases that are pushed along at an appropriate time, the better, and the less appeals we have, the better. I, think, I don't think you get better justice because you have more appeals. That, that doesn't seem to fit in. And secondly, which is far more important, our legal education must improve. And we are, some of us are taking some steps in that direction. We have far better colleges, universities and so on. But the legal education is where we get our basic raw material. The people who ultimately become magistrates, who become judges. And you see, as you rightly said, the, it's the people who come into contact with the magistrates, with the judges and all that, not with the Supreme Court and the highest court in the land. And they then feel that this system is either corrupt or this system is not performing well and what can we do to reform it. Now, that's where some sense of values has to be part of that legal education system. Now, there's no other method because I don't think that we are either born good or born bad. We have to be made good from, from anything that uh, transpires. And, but for education, I don't think that we can do very much in this country. So ultimately, uh, Mr. Nariman, do lawyers uh, ever retire or they just keep practicing for as long uh, as they're physically able to? Uh, is, is there a goal, an objective that you think for yourself the time will be right for you when you feel I have done what I set out to do? Yes, but uh, at the moment I think that the position is that most lawyers never retire, they only fall dead. 
and uh, as far as I am concerned, I try and avoid that if I can at an appropriate time. You must know when to leave. I think it's in every form of activity, in every office that you hold. You must have the prescience to know when enough is enough. You may be one of the best persons in the world. We've had this in our bar associations, we've had this in various, where a person thinks that he must go on forever. People want appointments for life. See, you must know when to go. And uh, of course, the constitutional age for judges is written in the constitution. For lawyers, there's no, no, nothing written at all. And uh, the lawyer goes on and on and on until he's able to convince himself or others convince him that he should not go on any longer. That sometimes happens and then it becomes an ego problem. Well, Mr. Nariman, in your case, enough is plainly not yet enough. <laughs> I don't Good luck know. and thank you very much indeed. Thank you. This has been a real pleasure. Thanks. Thank you.